Good morning again. It's good to be inside, right? Sun's gone again. Looks like another two inches have fallen since we started singing. If you were with us last week, you were a part of something very special and, uh, in my opinion, the start of a tradition of me preaching for two hours every Sunday. Oh, lots more groaning in second service than first service. In first service, they knew that couldn't be possible without going over time. Last week was so special as we celebrated the retirement and ministry of Pastor Bob and Cindy. As we gathered together in a special way, it was just a continual, the, the, the whole day was just packed with smiles and surprises and hugs and uh, well wishes and excitement about the future. As we, we gathered as a pastoral team uh, with the Croft family and their extended family for uh, dinner that night, it was just a continual um, expression of faithfulness as they all joined together and we joined in the, the beauty of being in relationship together. Thank you for the expressions that you did last Sunday and that you will continue to do. That's, that, that's our opportunity as we continue to move forward. I hope you will continue to celebrate Pastor Bob and Cindy. I hope you will continue to invite them into relationship with you and your family and uh, enjoy uh, being a part of life together. Relationships are a part of what it means to be in community together. Relationships are why an event like Beast Feast matters so much to us. Relationships are, are really a, a lifeblood for how it is we relate to one another, one another and do life together. In a message that I, I preached a, a while ago, I reminded us then of what continues to be true in my day-to-day -day experience, that relationships, unique as they are, are, are the most difficult and most rewarding, most faceted, and most complex, most changing and variable things that we deal with in our human experience. We, we know the benefit and the curse of relationship, right? We know the, the ups and downs of being in relationship with people. People are hard. Somebody say amen. Relationships are complex, challenging, changing. Do you find it interesting? I'm going to get in trouble. Do you find it interesting that there are some people that you like and some people that you don't like? I'm not advocating that you don't like somebody, Okay. But do you, you feel that, that, that you, you got some people in your life that you're like, oh, that person, that, that's, that's, my, that's my BFF, that's, that's, my, that's my inner circle kind of person. And some people that you're like, okay, I, I can keep them over, over here. I can like them, love them, but I don't need to spend a lot of time. Relationships are like that, right? They're, they're, they're complex and they're changing. There are seasons of relationships. I'm going to say it this morning. You have a favorite aunt and uncle? I've got a favorite aunt and uncle, and they're here this morning. What is it about people that cause us to either pursue or distance ourselves? Is it like experiences? Is it uh, growing up in similar circumstances? Is it growing up in the same spot? You have like some neighborhood friends who you're in deep relationship together. Is it shared experience? Is it shared likes and dislikes? Is it just random Roll the dice, and some people you get along with, and some people you don't. Whatever the circumstance, and whatever may or may not draw us together or separate us from all the human relationships that we navigate on a day-to-day -day basis, one thing we do know is the value of a deep friendship, a full expression of relationship with other human beings. As human beings, uh, the, the very nature of our created beings, the, the, the way that we are created, we are created to do life with other people. We are not meant to be Bear grills solo out in the woods by ourselves for our whole life. Even a survivalist expert makes time for family and friends. We need each other. Other relationships are, are what give us energy today. Again, relationships are what help us to function. We are mattering together in relationship. Relationships. 
We've all probably either referred to it or, or at least heard of the, the conversation about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to give our life to Christ in the context of our understanding of the benefit of relationship. We talk about being in relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords through Jesus Christ, right? We use that terminology because we know the benefit we, we don't talk about being in a relationship with Jesus like being in a relationship with a, an estranged loved one. We, we talk about the benefit of a relationship, a positive relationship, being an illustration of what it means to walk in faith. Those who are serious about following Jesus Christ understand that it means walking in deep relationship, of knowing and being known a close relationship with jesus and with other christ followers is what it means to be walking in faith as a christian knowing up here and knowing by the way we express his love are important to distinguish as we talk about all matters of faith this morning we're going to look at luke chapter 24 here we are weeks before easter and we're going to celebrate again the resurrected Christ as we refer to this passage that catches up with the story after Jesus has been crucified, buried, and resurrected as we catch the narrative in Luke 24, starting with verse 13. Listen to God's word again with me this morning. This is Resurrection Sunday. Verse 13 says, that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. Put your finger there. I love reading between the lines here. I love not knowing exactly what's going on here. I love that there's some confusion in these two that are walking as Jesus appears in my brain, says ninja format, perhaps. Somehow... They don't get it. The narrative goes on, verse 17. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group and his, of his followers were at his tomb early this morning. They came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Verse 25, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus. The end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it, then he broke it, and he gave it to them. Suddenly, Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And in that moment, at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us? As he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Let's pray. Warm our hearts too, Lord. Thank you for your living word. Thank you for the reminders again here this morning from your living word of how we too 
can apply your truth to our everyday and live out the expression of faith that we have in relationship with you. Bless this time, I pray in Jesus' name. In this passage this morning, we have these two followers of Jesus walking on the road on Easter Sunday morning. They don't call it Easter Sunday. Here it is, Resurrection Sunday. They've heard some rumors. Here they are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They're going about their business. They're moving along, perhaps. We have one name, but we don't know who the other is. I think it's important to note here the way Luke describes this encounter with these two with Jesus, they refer to it that when Jesus is with them, their hearts burned within them. Their hearts were warmed. Their hearts were challenged. They felt something. They knew inside of themselves more than just knowledge. They knew somewhere deep inside that they experienced the presence of God himself. Hearts warmed by the relationship and interaction with God in flesh. I want to say it again this morning. You and I can experience that same heart-burning relationship with the God of the universe who desires to be in and with us. The question is how? How do we experience that? How do we experience a heart-warming relationship with God Almighty? 17 points this morning. First is this. It involves fellowship. Again, who is it that's walking together on this road? It's Cleopas and his buddy Billy. I don't know. We don't know who it is that he's walking with here. We don't understand the context. I'm curious about only why one gets named and the other doesn't. Whoever it was, Luke records that Jesus was the topic of this conversation as they are traveling together. As they are walking together, verse 14 says, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had transpired, everything that had happened. They're, they're talking about the details. They're talking about the, the, the trouble of the last three days. They're talking about the, the way things transpired. As they're walking, they, they're, they're depressed. They're, they're crushed by the events, Scripture says. Their faces are downcast. They're, they're heartbroken as they recounted these details of what Jesus endured. Such a painful end. Now, here they are filled with this curiosity at this growing rumor. They've heard some conversations in the city of Jerusalem. They've, they've heard some things that perhaps his body isn't where it's supposed to be. An empty tomb. And I think it's purposeful for us to note that although they are in this depressed state, although their spirits are crushed, although their, their faces are downcast, scriptures, as, as, as they are experiencing the emotion of sadness, they are still together in fellowship with one another, doing this journey together. Even in the brokenness that they're experiencing, they have joined together. There's a lesson here for us. You've heard it a million times. We're better together. Remember? The joy of coming alongside is not simply to celebrate the greatest of times. It is to journey together in the broken parts too. We've been reminded throughout scripture of the importance of coming together, of linking arms with one another. You've heard this passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two people are better off than one. For they can help each other succeed. If one falls, the other can reach out and help. Someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. How can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We know. We've been impacted. We've experienced the benefits of coming together. An event like yesterday's Peace Feast couldn't happen to the effectiveness and the impact that it is without the team effort, without coming together for the purpose of loving large. The importance of fellowship, of being together, of joining arms, linking together was something the early church was reminded of again and again and testified to. The author of Hebrews says this in chapter 10, verse 24. Let us 
think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good beast feasts. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do when the hours change. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You hear the anticipation and the, the alarm and the action of being in proximity, of doing life together, of being a part of what it means to fellowship with the people of God. Let us not neglect to experience a true and heartwarming relationship with Jesus. We can't emphasize enough in our life the benefit of regular fellowship with others who are walking the same road with us, of, of talking things over, of working out our faith in conversation, of asking hard questions, and sometimes not coming up with the answer. In our culture, division is the norm, right? Right? Division is the temptation of all human relationships, of finding someone that you agree with and finding someone else that you don't and camping out with the people that you agree with and ignoring or distancing the people that you don't, of demanding my way or the highway. That's the temptation of the human experience. And truly, when the, when the devil, the, the enemy of our hearts, when the one who seeks to destroy enacts his will on human relationships, when the devil seeks to divide and conquer where there is true Christian fellowship, where the church is on display in acts of fellowship together, the devil's plans can be thwarted. How can we have a heartwarming relationship with Jesus? It starts with fellowship. Secondly, it involves scripture. The word of God. In the story this morning, it was when Jesus opened the scriptures that Cleopas and his walking buddy's hearts burned within them. Verse 27, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We can only imagine this light bulbs coming on and going off, dimming and getting brighter as Jesus reaches into his back pocket and pulls out his phone and the YouVersion Bible app and begins to scroll through the Old Testament scriptures and the writings of Moses, and he's telling these two as they're journeying together, don't you see, did you see about the Messiah? He was supposed to suffer. He's pointing out these prophecies that they knew that he's reaching them where they are. They know these scriptures. It's true in our lives as well as we approach, as we approach God's word that he meets us where we are. The Bible literally comes alive as God's Holy Spirit reveals himself again and again to us. The Bible, God's word, raises our understanding level. When Jesus explained, these two understood. They saw some things. For us, God's word contains the answers to all of life's issues. So God's word needs to be the place that we turn to to navigate. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. My prayer again recently, I believe inspired by God himself, has been for our church to hunger, to increase in our hunger for his word. God's word also recovers our hope. In verse 21, they explained to Jesus that they had hoped that this crucified Jesus would have been they thought maybe he was the Messiah. I love the nuance here. It's not lost on us as we read this narrative. Here they are explaining in their downcast ways that they've lost their hope, that he would have been who they thought he might be. And here he is in their presence, and it's not yet revealed. It's mysterious in this way. But the restored hope comes as he continues to reveal himself. They seem to have lost hope, but in Jesus they will have, and we truly have, hope. Likewise, God's word restores our joy. And their joy, 
Luke says again that these two road travelers have downcast faces, that they are depressed as they are traveling together, recounting. Maybe there's tears in their eyes and they're sorrowful in the recounting of what has taken place. And now they are experiencing again the presence of Jesus and their time with Jesus leaves them with a newfound joy and warmed hearts as the narrative reveals. How can we have a heartwarming relationship with Jesus? It starts with fellowship. It involves scripture. Third, it involves his presence, right? It involves the very presence of Jesus. Look at verse 28 again. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he was going to go on, continue on, but they begged him, stay with, stay with us, stay the night with us, since it's getting late. So he goes home with them. Even before they knew Jesus, even before they knew that it was Jesus, the risen Christ, something about their time with him encouraged them to beg him to stay a little while longer, to stay in his presence. So they serve him a meal and ask him to stay longer, to prolong his presence with them. I think this is a huge reminder to a busy American way of the ways in which we experience the presence of God through Jesus, through relationship with him, and then we move on to the next thing so quickly. We, we, we book events and coordinate times together. We schedule ourselves with as many appointments as we can and need. Church, it would benefit us so greatly as individuals and corporately if we would truly make better time for his presence in our life. And I'm not advocating that we, we have to spend the first hour of every day. There's lots of schools of thought of when and where our devotions need to happen, where it is we need to set that time. I want to encourage us to experience the presence of God in the everyday, all day ways. The same presence is available to us every hour of the day. Our response to acknowledging his presence is to make time to focus on listening for his voice, to linger in his presence, to invite him to reveal himself again in everything we are doing. How do we experience a heartwarming relationship through Jesus Christ finally this morning? It seems, according to this account here in Luke 24, that it involves testimony. It involves storytelling. It involves talking about it. Recall these last couple verses again from this passage. Verse 30. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappears. <laughs> Maybe there was smoke. I don't know. Verse 32. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Verse 33, within the hour, some translations say, at once, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They had to run and tell someone about it. There they found the 11 and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Do you see what's going on here? They're sharing the story. They're confirming God's presence. They're confirming the good news. They're confirming, yes, Jesus was the Messiah. He appeared to us again and we didn't see it and we didn't know. And then he explained to us that they're telling the story. They're going a mile a minute, you can imagine. These two road companions could not keep what they had experienced to themselves. So they got moving. To share the good news with others who were being impacted already in their way by the good news. Church, most of us have experienced the benefit of hearing the testimony of another believer who has walked a unique road, a unique season of life. We, we, we've done life together enough in certain situations where someone else speaks words of encouragement into us because of how they have experienced the presence of Almighty God. The sharing of testimony as a part of walking this road of faith. Is so important to build up the body of Christ. It has to happen in the hallways, in the classrooms, over men's breakfast. Again, more fun than women's breakfast. The sharing of testimony builds up the body. We use the word edifies in Christian circles. It 
is a positive expression of reminding each other of the confirmation in our hearts, in our experiences of how God has shown up. It does something to us when we talk about the things of God, when we ask deep questions, when we express how he is showing up in our lives. It does something to build up his church. To walk in a relationship and have a heartwarming experience with Jesus encouragement for us this morning is to draw from this experience of Cleopas and his travel companion. We should be encouraged to cultivate warm, personal relationships through fellowship of other Christian believers. We need each other. We must be encouraged to spend time in God's word, allowing it to speak to us. God's living word to challenge, convict, and warm our hearts. We must be encouraged to practice the presence of Christ. To experience his presence means more than it means more than bowing your head every once in a while. It means acknowledging him in the every moment of the every day, of asking him to reveal himself in the every moment of the every day, of pausing to reflect, acknowledge in your families, acknowledge to those around you where it is you see God showing up. Recognize him as the unseen guest at every meal, the unheard participant in every conversation, the unseen companion on every road trip. We can be encouraged as the church to spread the warmth of what it means to have our hearts warmed by relationship with Jesus to others, sharing what Christ is doing in and through us. Sharing the good news by fellowshipping and testifying with one another. Letting someone else in on God's expression of love in your life. Brothers and sisters, I hope you've had a true burning heart experience. As these two on the road to Emmaus I hope you've experienced what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. If you have not, I would love to talk to you about that. It doesn't take a special set of words or a specific prayer. It really takes a broken and contrite heart, a submissive will, an act of surrender. It takes examining our hearts to see if there are ways in which we have chosen a different route for ourselves, Maybe you've had that warmed heart, and by chance, it's cooled off. It's got less warm. If that's the case, there's nothing that you can do over your stove to warm it. Rather, there's one who's waiting to be let back in. I really believe, I really believe the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords desires to be in relationship with his creation. I've really experienced it. I know it to be true. And I hope you will too. Will you stand with me? Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for your living word. Again, this morning, Lord, it doesn't make any sense in our human understanding. doesn't make any human sense for the 
author of all creation, to desire to be in relationship with sinners such as us. And yet you do. That's why we use terms like reckless, uncomfortable as it may be. It doesn't make sense on paper. Thank you. Thank you for loving differently than us and for desiring, Lord, to walk with us, to warm our hearts, to change us, to make us new every single day. Lord, in the challenge again this morning to live out the expression of desiring warmed hearts by your presence, would you answer our prayer? Would you meet us where we are? Would you reveal yourself? Would you draw us into opportunities of fellowship? Would your word come alive again? Lord, would we experience the magnificence of being in your presence? And Lord, as we do, would you help us to share it with others? Lord, as others share their testimony, would you give us ears to hear? We love you and we thank you for loving us. We pray your blessing upon all that is said according to your will here. In Jesus' name, God's people said. Amen. Love you, church. God bless you.